All right, now let's talk about the development of the neck and the cranial nerves involved in that process, including the whole face. So when the uh, face is developing, the structures of the face are actually developing from neural crest cells that have migrated away from the neural tube. Uh, so this includes the bones of the face uh, as well as other structures involved. The paraxial mesoderm is still involved in the posterior portion of the face. The, um, the occipital and parietal bones uh, <clears throat> And this, uh, once you think about it a little bit more, this makes sense because these regions of the head, their sensory innervation comes from cervical uh, spinal nerves, like the great, uh, the great occipital and lesser occipital and the uh, third occipital nerve. Uh, and finally, the uh, laryngeal cartilages of the neck are developing from the lateral plate mesoderm. So, the um, development of the face <clears throat> is all about prominences. Uh, so we see here uh, different prominences that develop and enlarge, and from those prominences, we're going to see that specific structures end up developing, specific cranial nerves, specific bones and cartilage, specific artery branches, uh, and specific muscles. So uh, the, we can see here the frontonasal prominence, which is going to become the forehead, the maxillary prominence that's going to become the uh, cheek region, and then the mandibular arch forming uh, to ultimately become the mandible. Uh, so here we have an electron micrograph of all of these arches beginning to form in the third uh, through fourth week. So we name these uh, different arches just sequentially. So yes, I can count. Uh, so there is no fifth arch in humans. Uh, the fifth arch is very early on obliterated. So we are left with a first, uh, second, third, fourth, and sixth arches. So here we see a cross section through there. We can see that within those arches ends up developing uh, a nerve artery and the cartilage bone model that will create those different regions. We can also see those um, uh, from this lateral view, the arteries, how they branch into those different uh, arches. Between the arches, which is the big bulbous portion, we have a, a uh, pharyngeal um, membrane. <clears throat> and that membrane is on either side uh, has a little uh, divot called a cleft on the outside and a pouch on the inside. So as we talk more about the structures and what they become, understanding the cleft and the pouch and the membrane and the arch uh, is going to be important in the discussion. So let's just go through these arches and talk about what they end up forming. So the first arch we see here is going to end up forming mostly V3, the mandibular branch, with uh, also some of the maxillary portion of V2. But remember, the frontal, uh, the, um, uh, frontal prominence, uh, that uh, main arch uh, is forming the forehead, it's going to receive components of V1. So obviously V1 is not a part of the first arch, that's why it's not listed. The second arch ends up forming facial nerve, we have glossopharyngeal in the third, and in the uh, fourth and sixth arches, we have portions of vagus nerve. Uh, so the uh, superior laryngeal portion of vagus nerve from the fourth, and the recurrent laryngeal nerve from the sixth. <clears throat> so we'll see that the arteries that supply these different regions also form inside these arches. So the first arch forms the maxillary artery, which supplies deep portions of the face uh, down into the mandible, because maxillary artery gives off a branch uh, that enters the mandible. The second arch gives off a hyoidal and stapedial artery, uh, and so we know that facial nerve uh, is supplying the, um, 
uh, these, uh, the, well, you don't know the stapedius muscle at this point, uh, but it's innervated by facial. Um, and then, of course, we have the um, mylohyoid as well. Uh, so anyway, moving on to the third arch, carotid artery uh, formed from this arch. Fourth arch, uh, we're going to have, uh, well, you can read the structures here. There's no need for me to do that. So common carotid, uh, subclavian, and the sixth arch actually forms portions of the uh, heart, the, the pulmonary artery and the ductus uh, arteriosus artery. So those are, are, the ductus arteriosus is important in development. We'll learn more about that when we learn about the development of the heart. So just put a pin in that and we'll get back to that. The bones. So this is going to follow the pattern as you expect. You've got the first arch forming the mandible as well as the malleus and incus. So remember, you have the um, tensor tympani that's going to uh, be innervated along with the muscles of mastication. So that makes sense. Second, uh, arch has uh, forms the stapes as well as the styloid process. Remember, stylohyoid uh, muscle innervated by facial nerve. So uh, makes sense. Uh, moving on to the third arch, we have a portion of the hyoid. Uh, fourth arch, the thyroid cartilage, and then the laryngeal cartilage heading uh, inferiorly. This makes sense because the laryngeal cartilages uh, contain the larynx, the voice box, which is innervated by recurrent laryngeal nerve. And finally, the muscles. The first arch, the muscles of mastication, and the other muscles innervated by trigeminal. Uh, second is the muscles of facial expression along with stylohyoid and the neck muscles innervated by facial. Third is the stylopharyngeus, as you'd expect, innervated by glossopharyngeal. So uh, that's why uh, we you know, clearly understand glossopharyngeal is innervating stylopharyngeus. And then fourth is the vagus nerve and its innervation of pharyngeal constrictors, uh, as well as a few others that vagus nerve innervates. And then six, the intrinsic laryngeal muscles from the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So it all makes sense. I've provided you in your slide deck this table that is um, comprehensive. Uh, so you can use this as a basis for your studies. Now let's talk about the pharyngeal clefts. During development, the second pharyngeal arch ends up uh, uh, passing over, growing over the third arch uh, and merging with the fourth arch, overgrowing uh, the, the clefts uh, on the outside. So we see here those clefts in red on the outside. We see uh, the second arch growing over. So the uh, first pharyngeal cleft and membrane are intact. They remain, but the rest are um, overgrown. This results in what's called a pharyngeal sinus. So a pharyngeal sinus is this small little pocket that is usually obliterated by uh, the seventh week, but there are cases where it doesn't. And that uh, can result in a pharyngeal cyst where fluid edema infection builds up in that space. We'll talk more about that. But before we do, I wanna talk about the first pharyngeal membrane and cleft because they form important structures. The uh, first, uh, so think about it, we're between the first and second arches, we're between the, um, the facial and the trigeminal nerves, <clears throat> and we have ended up gaining components of the third and fourth arches. Uh, so that means glossopharyngeal and vagus nerve. So the first uh, pharyngeal membrane becomes the tympanic membrane in the adult. That means the first pharyngeal cleft becomes the external auditory meatus in the adult. And the first pharyngeal pouch on the inside becomes the uh, middle ear <clears throat> with the pharyngeal tube. So this is also, this also explains why the external auditory meatus and the ear are innervated by so many different structures. Why you can have um, the tragus of the ear innervated by uh, 
trigeminal while you have facial nerve innervating the helix, the oracle of the ear, and down into the, um, the external auditory meatus, you have glossopharyngeal and vagus innervation uh, as well. So uh, all of that makes sense out of what we've already learned. It's cementing that information. So now let's talk about these cervical cysts, lateral cervical cysts that form from the pharyngeal sinus. Again, uh, so typically not an issue and can easily be surgically removed, uh, you know, even in toddlerhood or infanthood. Um, but uh, they don't usually become a problem, even if they become enlarged from edema, unless there's an infection. And infections aren't common unless there's a fistula that connects the sinus to the internal or external environment. And that fistula can be caused by an incomplete overgrowth by the second pharyngeal arch. So here we have an example of an external uh, fistula that's open to the external environment, so detritus and whatnot can get in there. Here we have an example of an internal uh, fistula into this pharyngeal sinus. And that internal for, uh, fistula commonly goes toward the uh, second pharyngeal pouch. We'll learn in a minute. The second pharyngeal pouch forms the tonsils. So if the tonsils become infected, <clears throat> then that infection can easily travel through this fistula if it exists, if that failure occurred in development, to infiltrate the later, lateral cervical cyst and cause uh, issues. So this, these fistulas have to be surgically repaired if they exist. And you, you probably don't know they exist until an infection occurs. So let's talk about these pouches now. What do these pouches become? We know the first pouch becomes the middle ear. Uh, so here we can see that, the auditory tube. So that makes sense. We already understand that. The second pouch becomes the palatine tonsils, the epithelium around the palatine tonsils. The um, uh, third pouch is going to end up dividing, and that division will result in uh, the development of two different glandular structures. The parathyroids, uh, the inferior parathyroids, um, posterior thyroid gland, as well as the thymus, which is responsible for developing T cells and whatnot. The thymus resides on top of the heart, so it descends. Uh, so, the, uh, where are we now? We're on the fourth uh, pouch. That pouch also subdivides. The superior uh, component ends up forming the superior parathyroids on the posterior thyroid, and the inferior component forms the um, functional C cells of the thyroid, the secretory uh, cells of the thyroid gland. The rest of the thyroid is developed from a small region uh, on the posterior portion of the tongue called the foramen cecum, and that ends up forming a thyroglossal duct as it travels down the neck. So that thyroglossal duct is why pyramidal lobes of thyroid glands sometimes exist, because that duct remained and the thyroid tissue, as it grew and expanded, entered the, uh, the uh, thyroglossal duct. <clears throat> so, here is an example of a thyroid gland ex vivo. You can see the lobes, the isthmus, and that uh, pyramidal lobe. Now let's talk about the, uh, the development of a tongue, uh, because this also explains some of the stuff we understand from the cranial nerve. So the tongue develops from a number of structures along the inner surface of uh, the uh, pharyngeal um, the developing pharyngeal component of the embryo. And so uh, the, um, the uh, distal and medial tongue buds are swellings or prominences that form uh, from tissue that has infiltrated that structure from the first arch. Uh, so um, the distal tongue buds uh, you know, quickly become the prominent structures during development. Uh, 
uh, and form the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. So we can see that progress occur here in these next few slides. Now the uh, cupola gets contributions uh, from the second pharyngeal arch knowing that the taste buds are formed or innervated by facial nerve which comes from the second pharyngeal arch you can guess that that uh, cupola uh, contributes these structures the taste bud structures which end up dispersing uh, and covering the anterior uh, two-thirds of the tongue next we have the uh, hypobranchial eminence, which forms the posterior third of the tongue. So contributions from um, the third arch. So the taste buds forming from that third arch, the uh, glossopharyngeal arch, so that makes sense. <clears throat> now the interface between the um, these tongue buds that are forming is called the sulcus terminalis. And in the adult, this is a visible structure which we call the circumvallate papillae. Uh, so these are enlarged uh, papillary tongue bud, um, 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 taste bud type structures, uh, which you can see in a kind of chevron shape. Uh, moving on, so... <clears throat> now let's talk about, of course, when we talk about development, we always want to know what can go wrong with development. So there are syndromes involved in malformation of these different types of structures. So one of these syndromes is called first arch syndrome, in which neural crest cells have not migrated. They failed to migrate into the first arch and form the structures of the first arch. Uh, so one of these types of syndromes is called Treacher-Collins syndrome, so it encompasses uh, first arch syndrome issues as well as some others, but uh, you will see underdeveloped mandibular uh, mandible as well as the uh, zygomatic bone. The ear will be poorly formed because as we know, the first arch contributes to the ear. Uh, but because uh, none of these structures are involved in the central nervous system, um, we don't have cognitive deficits. We just have these external defi deficits. Uh, so about 1 in 10,000 births have this condition, and they can be uh, mild to severe, as you see here. So mild, uh, you know, to however many degrees of severity of hypoplasia and malformation. Another type of syndrome called DeGeorge syndrome uh, is a failure of neural crest cells migrating to the third and fourth arch. So you have failure of the thymus and parathyroid, so that's going to impact the immune system as well as the um, endocrine functions of the uh, thyroid gland. Uh, you're going to have issues with arterial formation around the heart, so that ductus arteriosus is going to remain and cause turbulence and and um, cause a lack of uh, oxygenation of blood. Um, but you'll have very little facial disorders because most of these, the third and fourth arch isn't contributing to the ear in uh, physical, meaningful ways. But uh, you might have some other issues because those third and fourth arches contribute to the tongue and some of the cleft, the, the palate structure. So you might have cleft palate uh, etc. There are also issues uh, in development of the tongue. So you can have a, a, a ankyloglossia, which is a tied tongue. The frenulum underneath the tongue uh, can be uh, overly enlarged. Uh, so this can lead to problems with uh, uh, you know speech and infant feeding. The child can't suckle as easily. Uh, so about uh, four to five percent of newborns, um, most of the time, you know, it's left alone until it becomes a problem, and then it can be surgically snipped with, uh, you know, no major defects. 
Uh, midwives, you might see they, have, they usually cultivate their uh, little fingernail, the fingernail on their pinky finger. That's because if a midwife sees this in a newborn infant, they're going to just dig their pinky fingernail underneath there and snip it out right as soon as uh, the kid makes an entrance. And then other issues, um, bifid tongue, where the tongue buds don't meet in the middle. So you have this really cool forked tongue, uh, like a snake, perhaps. Or uh, also macroglossia, where the tongue buds overform. So, you know that guy from KISS, what's his name? Gene Simmons. I think he probably has macroglossia on an enlarged tongue, because he can make his tongue uh, go pretty far out of his mouth, do some pretty rad things. So that's all I've got for development. Hope you enjoyed it.